Now, ladies and gentlemen, over to the last technical session. C.A. Prashant. Uh, it was indeed a uh, lot of uh, revealing thoughts from various speakers and uh, to take the cue from where uh, Adukiya sir had left, let us uh, think forward and see how we can grow our business too. And as a result of that, uh, uh, let us start with say, what happened when uh, US fought with Iraq? What happened? Then Iraq was properly back bombed and then what happened, uh, terrorists boomed and then they hit the towers. In the process, somebody sitting and praying God, being a pastor, he was just praying God and then he started seeing these observations. So what did he do? Then he realized, so who are the neighbors of Iraq? These are all Israelis and Palestinians. Okay. They are some of the richest in the world. And when it comes to Funding in any of the US biggest NGOs and those kind of things it is their money that is running today. And as a result of all these wars, what happens? There is turbulence. When there is turbulence, people would naturally go to God. Obviously. And when they go to God, you need more churches for Jewish. And you need more churches, you need more funds. And in need of more funds, you need to create your organizations. So one such person did it and he did it in such a way that you know he started creating more and more pro programs for all the Jewish people, started conducting events and then raised funds and then he kept the money with him and then he used to utilize for the same operations. But then this is all tons and tons of money. Who has to account it? Finally the chartered accountants. Obviously, right? So what he did was he started his company and started an accounting of all the NGOs and this is in US and as a mirror image in India in our firm we are doing the outsourcing firm so that is the international connect what Mr. Adukiya sir was trying to tell that is fine so we will get the job we will do the work so then what happens in the NGO so we do have business opportunities in this the first question we have to ask is, where is the accountant to do accounting now? How many accountants are there now? Leave the chartered accountants. Even to pass basic entries, people are not available. They are in short numbers actually. Yes. And it's not that they are in short numbers. The trained people are in short numbers. So the primary responsibility of the people is to train the people to become proper accountants. Agreed? So that is the most important thing. Imagine uh, you are doing NGO of, uh, you are doing audit of a uh, NGO and uh, the inmates are the members who are the beneficiaries, they are working for the trust. As a result of that, there is business that is going on and it earns profit. As a result of that, you know, you need to prepare financials and all that and you have to give your audit. Fair enough. So, these people, who, whoever is the members in the NGOs, they have uh, say manufactured something, they are selling also and you go and do the audit. Now you ask him, uh, give me a inventory listing on FIFO basis. Where is the accountant in the NGO to do this? So the most challenging thing is to employ proper people in accounting in the NGOs. That should be the primary area. And you will tell him, I want to know SBA TT buying rate for this. He will go and collapse listening to this because he would not even have heard of any terminology like that in his lifetime. And he will tell, uh, uh, you will go and ask him, give me the vouchers. He will bring in one, one sack of bills and place it before you. I will do the audit for that. So that is not the way the audit and accounting needs to be done in NGO. So we need more trained staff and then as a result of that, uh, the opportunity for the chartered accountants is to train more and more accountants. So how to do it? That is the thought process that you have to individually build upon. From the concept side, all of us are telling not for profit making, not for profit making organization. So if NPO should not make profit, then why tax it? Correct? So actually the objective is not that. The objective is the intention of the law is to tax private profit and not the profit to be used for objects of the trust. 
This forms the basis of section 1023C and section 11 of the Indian Income Tax Act. So basically we cannot tell that not for profit organization does not make profit. If it does not make profit or a surplus, that means to say it is not able to sustain on its own. So in that case it collapses. So as a result of that it is supposed to make profit, but the intention of NPO is not to make private profit. Okay. So that is to do with the NPO concept on, uh, uh, I mean, why the NPO should be there. So basically NPOs can be classified into these public charitable trusts, societies, universities or other educational institutions, hospitals, research <coughs> associations. Now we have section 8 companies which was as well section 25 companies in the Companies Act 1956. So now in 2013 we have section 8 companies. Primarily when it comes to trust, all of us know that you know uh, anybody wants to tell that my property has to be utilized in this manner. He need not write anything, the trust is created. So that is what is called as an endowment. When it comes to societies, group of people want to do some activity. As a result of that, for common objectives they come together and then they would <coughs> do some common objective which is beneficial to the society as such. University or other educational institutions for the purpose of spreading education, hospitals for medical, research associations for research and then all these companies under section 25. Basically why do you want to create a company? You can always create a trust or a society, right? So you create a section 25 company to ensure that the advantage of, of a corporate form is there to that organization. For example, you want to form a trade association. You don't form a society for a trade association. You incorporate yourself as a company under section 25 just to ensure that because the kind of issues what trade association is going to uh, you know, handle it is quite possible that somebody may become liable in trade association itself. So it makes sense that it is in a corporate form and it is you know insulated with the company law. So let us look at uh, some uh, implications of accounting in the NGO sectors. Accounting is gone by same, uh, the NGOs are gone by same accounting standards as for business enterprises. There are no separate standards for NPOs. Cash or accrual system, uh, no single regulatory body, different acts and different provisions are there, varied types of assessees are there. We'll just go one by one for each of it. What is the interesting fact of accounting standard? The accounting standards, if you read the preface, it says it is applicable for business organizations. So primarily for not-for-profit organizations, the accounting uh, standards are not applicable. But then, if you look at technical guide on not-for-profit organizations, the guidance note, the technical guide that is issued by the ICI, it says implementation of the accounting standards is recommended. So as a result of that, the person who is doing the accounting and the person doing the audit, obviously, will have to follow the accounting standards to ensure that there is present, better presentation of the books of accounts. Then you may say, what is the what is the advantage of keeping all this according to the accounting standards? Let us take an example. We took all the uh, scenarios where uh, Sri Lakshmi had mentioned there are so many ways of uh, obtaining the funds into the NGOs. One of those that she had mentioned was obviously, you know, very big foreign funds, uh, something like Clinton Foundation and those kind of things, correct? So, or we have, here we have say a Wipro Foundation or something like this. And there is an NGO. And NGO wants to tell that, okay, I want to uplift the blind people as a result of that, these are the activities that I propose to do and this is my project report. Is that sufficient? The person who is going to fund the person would certainly wants to see how does the financials of this NPO looks like. Is it safer to give the money to these people? Are they trustworthy? As a result of that, the audit report that the auditor signs gains a lot of significance. So that is where it comes telling that, you know, accounting standards, you know, Although it is difficult to implement and people may not have knowledge to implement this also, it is quite relevant in this case because that is when you, you can have a proper uh, disclosed balance sheet so that the person who wants to fund it is quite aware how the financials are prepared and how transparent it is. Let us take an example of cash and accrual system of accounting. All of us know that either you can maintain cash system of accounting or accrual system of accounting. So what? So what? Now, I, just now I told that we have to follow accounting standards, which also talks about accrual system of accounting. But then if you come to income tax law, what is the income tax law telling? Income tax law is telling, in order to allow you exemption under section 11, I want to see whether what funds you have received for the purposes of the trust, have you applied it properly. 
So what is the methodology it is talking about? It is talking about the cash basis of account. Correct? So why is accounting standard required then? It is purely from the perspective of you know showcasing NGO telling that this is how we have done our operations. But when it comes to tax computation, it is a different matter. Let us look at a scenario like say section 145 of the Income Tax Act 1961 is there which talks about method of accounting. It talks about cash basis and mercantile system of accounting. Two, <coughs> what kind of uh, income heads is this applicable if I have to ask? To, to what kind of income heads it is applicable? Section 145 of Income Tax Act. What is the income heads for which section 145 is applicable? Income from? Income from other sources, income from business. Correct? Now when it comes to charitable trust, where are we? We are in chapter 3. Where is the tax computation? Tax computation, the computation of income is in chapter 4. Correct? So when I come to business income or income from other sources, then I have to think about implementing section 145. Fair enough? So when I am still in chapter 3, the Income Tax Act is quite clear. From where did you get the fund? Where did you apply? Is it crossing that 85% mark or not? And based on that, I give you the exemption telling that your income is exempt. Right? So when it comes to that part of the computation telling that, you know, you have the receipts and you are applying it, for that section 145 does not apply. Basically, although some element of it you follow, but it does not apply. Okay, when does it apply then? The assessing officer tells that you are supposed to apply 85%, you applied 70%. So then, what happens? What happens? Then, chapter 3 is lost to the extent of the shortfall. You move into the tax computation module and then you will try to see how to compute the income. Once you try to see how to compute the income, you will see is it business or income from other sources. Appropriately, you will start doing the tax computation. So that is how the sequence runs. What is the challenge in accounting for the NPOs? The first list here says activities undertaken. Hospital, educational institutions, temple, library, clubs, sports, type, company, trust, society, work, public, private, non-government, government owned. Size, it can be small, medium or large. It can have different objectives. It can be specific aims like improving English in a backward area or benefit of public at large. Right? Quite simple. You read it perpendicularly now, try to read horizontally how simple it looks. Hospital can be company, trust, society, work, public. Or it can be small, medium or large. The objective can be anything. So look at the way the differentiation can happen in one, in the kind of business structuring that can happen in an NGO. For each combination of this, you need different types of, types of books of account to be kept, different kinds of financial statements to be cut for better understanding. So it is not an easy thing to tell that, okay, I know the debit and credit, let me start. It is quite apparent to understand that what is the nature of the activity the NPO is doing. Based on that, let me decide how to do the accounting for this. I have just tabulated a couple of laws that is applicable in our case. Say in, in Karnataka, uh, we have Karnataka Societies Registration Act, the Hindu Religious in in Institutions and Charitable Endowments Act, and Karnataka Sohar the Sankar Act. And in each of these acts, it clearly tells you know, how to maintain the books of accounts, how you are supposed to maintain the books of accounts. So it is all prescribed guidelines. Accounting under Societies Registration Act. The Societies Registration Act 1860 as such does not talk about book, does not talk about books of accounts. Okay? There are separate state-wise Societies Registration Act. You can uh, see here. Uh, uh, right from Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, uh, Goa. I mean, each state wise there is a Societies Registration Act, and there are, you know, uh, there is requirement of maintaining the books of accounts and then getting the audit done. And in the case of Karnataka Societies Act, specifically, if I have to mention, you have to be careful in ensuring that there is an AGM conducted. Many societies are running and running, but they don't know how, what compliances needs to be done. Under register of societies are they registered? Point number one. Any changes in the addresses, members, are they telling? Are they informing the register of societies or not? Then are they holding the AGM? And within 14 days from 
holding of AGM, are they filing the annual returns? Along with annual returns, are they mentioning who are the board of trustees, what are their occupations and how are they involved in these activities? So these procedural lapses has to be uh, eliminated and that is where active participants of the chartered accountants are required. Then you have accounting under state public trusts act also. Accounting under companies act. Uh, if I have to talk about the recent companies act, this is how it is designed right from section 8. Uh, registration 128 on books of accounts, 129 on financial statement, 133 central government to prescribe accounting standards. We are all still waiting for that. Financial statements board report and copy of financial statement to be filed with the registrar of companies. So, in a section 25 companies, we have to see how much of it is applicable and we, we are supposed to implement them. Then we have companies accounts rules 2014, which has been uh, uh, formulated and then CARO is not applicable to these companies. Then Ministry of Companies Affairs having the new rules regard to applicability of accounting standards made applicable to uh, all the previous accounting standards because the NAFRA, those kind of things are yet to be notified and then it will be implemented. Audit under Societies Registration Act. So as I told, it is responsibility of the auditor to ensure that all the compliances are done properly and these are the various uh, uh, states where specifically audit provisions have been mentioned. Under Income Tax Act, in order to claim exemption under 1023C and Section 11, what is the first most requirement? In case you have multiple operations in the trust, you have to ensure that in order to claim exemption under Section 1023C, you are supposed to maintain separate books of accounts. Have you maintained it? See, the first confusion what people may have is trust means one accounting. No, trust can be one but it can have 10 activities under that and say 5 are charitable, 5 is not, correct? So 5 are for charitable organization which satisfies the condition under 1023C and income at source is exempt from taxation. As a result of that, unless we maintain a separate books of account, that exemption is not allowed, correct? So separate books of accounts needs to be advised to the trust by the chartered accountants otherwise they would not keep it. And even for uh, obtaining section ATG registration or if you go for renewal, always they will ask you for 3 years previous audited financials and they would want to see whether the NPO or NGO <coughs> has already done as, uh, you know, actually done the objectives as described by the trustee. And there is specific requirement under FCR also. Uh, Mr. Adukia mentioned about Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Principally Foreign Contribution Regulation Act you know, uh, in a way took its shape almost in 1960. Uh, uh, there was the situation where all political parties were getting funding from the foreign countries. Then the, uh, it was thought in the country that, you know, some other country is going to influence the mindset of our country people, correct? So that needs to be regulated. As a result of that, Foreign Contribution Regulation Act was introduced. So what is the purpose of it? On a whole, it tells something like a political party or a political activity, newspaper agency, media agency. These are the people who are covered under FCRA and if they receive any contribution from a foreign source, then FCRA registration is mandated. That is how Foreign Contribution Regulation Act is designed. So in the case of uh, uh, the amended act is in 2010 and the rules have come in 2011. Uh, there are uh, various forms start from FC1 to FC10 and uh, I have embedded the uh, uh, file here which has the FC form. I mean this will be uploaded in the website so you will be able to download it later. Uh, basically how the accounts works is you have to see what is my foreign contribution project. For example, in case a FCRA registered entity wants to start a project and it is supposed to get the money from the foreign country it has to approach the Ministry of Home Affairs, apply an FC1, telling that I need a FCRA registration. So as a result of that, this is my project, this is going to be my, uh, this is my project report, this is the funding required and I am getting the funds from abroad, right. So based on the presentation made to the Ministry of Home Affairs, they would grant a registration under FCRA. Once the registration is given, the organization has to ensure that for foreign contribution projects, separate books of accounts are maintained. For non-foreign contribution projects, separate books of accounts maintained. Again, a different requirement under the law, 
ensuring that for foreign, foreign contribution, there has to be a separate books of account, clearly to establish the link from where did the source come, where is the, where has the application actually happened. These are some of the issues under FCR. What happens? You get a money, you get money from a foreign source. The law tells you should have a separate bank account, and into that bank account, the foreign source has to flow. Stop. Then how do I utilize? I am an NGO with 1,500 branches in India. How do I function? Only one bank account. So that was a limitation. So in 2011, they brought the amendment telling that for each branch, you can have a utilization bank account. So how the fund flows from foreign contribution account, designated account, it flows to each of the branches and from there the money gets spent for the specific project, right? Now, you may ask, you know, there is a possibility that some amount in the non-FC account has been pending. So what do I do? <coughs> so what you should do is, you have to take that money, what pertains to only foreign contribution, that alone can go back to the foreign contribution account. Okay, in case by chance you send a domestic receipt into foreign contribution account, it becomes a violation and then 2% of the amount or 10,000 rupees, whichever is higher, can be the penalty and it depends on the valuation. It will go up to 2%, 3%, 5%, the various penalties that are given for condonation also. So, that will become the issue there. Then FCRA registered entity has to maintain two separate books, one for FC and non-FC and it is mandatory. What happens to audit report? In case foreign contribution regulation act has not been followed by the organization, it is responsibility of the auditor to ensure that you know there is a proper disclosure in the audit report because it is a violation of law. When there is violation of law, does materiality matter? Materiality may not matter. So that means to say, Somebody has done violation of FCRA. As a result of that, it is responsibility of the chartered accountant to report it in the audit report. The auditor also has to ensure, I'm sorry, auditor will not ensure, the organization has to ensure, but auditor has to check that, you know, the organization has ensured that funds are not received from banned organizations. So there are list of banned organizations that has been provided and it is responsibility of the NGOs to find out what are those banned organizations. Auditor, how will he know whether it is a banned organization or not? Or, I mean, he may know banned organization, he will not know whether the money has come from banned organization or not. So as a result of that, you should have appropriate management representation letter. I am not telling it is an escape way out for auditor telling that I am not responsible for this. There has to be proper checks, checks and balances and verification from the auditor side. In spite of that, it becomes a mandatory thing that auditors collect the <coughs> management representation letter. Then NGOs, how do they safeguard? They are also under the same trouble. They don't know what money is coming. Is uh, foreign contribution or not? Or is it foreign source or not? One of the definition of foreign source says, if X, a foreign national, has given money to Y, an Indian resident, Indian national, and Indian national gives it to the trust, okay, it is deemed to be foreign contribution. Who will the NGO staying here know the source of the person who contributed? Quite not possible. So it makes it imperative for all the people, especially taking donations. It is very important to have a form called know your donor. Something like a know your donor must be there to ensure that, okay, you give a declaration that this source is India or not. So how do you ensure that? I know this is tricky and it is challenging and I can get hundreds of questions on this, but then this is the practical issue but there is no other way to at least make a proper documentation to ensure there is no non-compliance. So what happens in the case of balance sheet? You have foreign currency project, a foreign contribution and non-foreign contribution project. The consolidated balance sheet goes to income tax. Foreign contribution balance sheet alone goes to Ministry of Home Affairs. In order to transfer, okay, the, uh, the first violation I had mentioned was foreign contribution project cannot move money into non-foreign contribution account, okay. In what circumstances it can be done, up to 10% of the foreign contribution can be still diverted, but that has to be done along with, uh, according to the approval by the Ministry of Home Affairs and for that FC10 has to be uploaded online. 
Now we will see certain aspects of the taxation with respect to uh, non-profit non organizations. Basically all these are voluntary contributions. And I can tell you this is the maximum list. Why? When it comes to voluntary contribution, these are the 8 things that is list, listed in section 224 bracket 2A. Right? And basically all these 8 can be classified into 3 categories. One, uh, which can tell it is purely for charitable purposes and its objects are like this. Okay? those kind of things. Second is, it is for charitable organization but the, the total receipts during the uh, year is less than 1 crore. In that situation, there is no approval required from the Commissioner of Income Tax. But in case the contribution received is more than 1 crore, such organization under section 1023C are supposed to get the approval of the Principal Commissioner of Income Tax. Now let us ask this question, is education charity now? today. What is happening? Income tax department is questioning the fees collected from student. Is it voluntary? What is the flow of the section? Section 224 2A said voluntary contributions. <coughs> now section 11 is telling voluntary contribution received by an organization <coughs> for what? For health, for education, for charity and for general public utility. Correct? So when I collect fees a parent is going and paying the fees voluntarily. We don't know if that is the case, but then, okay, fees at least we can understand. Whatever is being collected is being used for the purpose of education. Fair enough. What happens to admission fees and development fees? And many other fees in quotations. So those are questionable by the income tax department and certainly take it from me income tax department is going to question this because one of the important amendment has come in the current budget and when we go to that slide I will just link to this. I am just touching upon a couple of sections just to uh, put forth a couple of issues in this. There is one section 11 subsection 1 clause A. It talks about you know it gives conditions that say 85 percent of the income earned in previous year has to be applied in that year for the objects of the trust. Okay. Exceptions to the above is if income is earned and not received or if received utilized in the immediately succeeding year then also exemption is earned. Then in case donations for specific purpose it is received and it forms part of the corpus then it has to be excluded from the income. There there is a issue, I will come back to that. And then however trust must give in writing before uh, uh, due date under section 139. One, there is no specific format. It has to tell that okay, this is how I am going to apply my receipts of the previous in the current year. Now, in this case, it says donations for specific purpose. So, what do you know? Uh, what is the specific purpose? Should donor tell this is the specific purpose for which you have to put it for use, or donee should say this is the specific purpose I have and for which I am going to use it. To my knowledge, in my opinion, both are same, and it should be allowed. But then, look at the interpretation how it goes. We started with 224 2A. It says voluntary contributions. It does not talk about corpus. Correct? Once the... I think that is not correct. You have to observe Supreme Court decision in Sitadas case. Diversion source, diversion at hand. Specific purpose means the donor he gives with a specific intention. That is diversion source. When you decide yourself, it is a designated fund, which is a peculiarity of a non cutting concern, not used for in 11th and 12th standard. Those <coughs> are obvious. No, but the, the point that I am trying to tell is under 11 1A, which of it you will exempt? Under 11 1A, which of it you will exempt? Whatever whatever the donor source, gives is diversion. diversion. Whatever donor is gives is diversion, it goes out of 224. And whatever Doni asks and it goes into the system, that is where 11 money comes into picture. That is how it is. Then we have section 11 bracket 2. And then we have the form 10 proceedings. How does it work? Uh, if you uh, see the requirement of the law, it says that 85% of the receipts by the trust or the NGO has to go for the charitable activities. Say for example, only 80% has been applied and 5% is not applied. So in this situation, 
before filing the return of income, the law tells you have to apply before the assessing officer and tell this I need to use it for future purposes and I want to accumulate it and I deposit, it, deposit the funds in section 11 bracket 5 investments. And then once the proceedings are through, there is a permission given and based on that the contribution is made. That is one part of it. Second part of it is say the return has already been filed and form time proceedings have not happened. So in this specific situation, in Nagpur Hotel Owners Association, the Supreme Court has observed that even in such scenario, at the point of the assessment proceeding, say the assessment is not yet completed, during the proceedings also, they can apply for the Form 10 and obtain the permission to make designated investments. But there is one small difference between 11.1a and 112 because both talk about you know, application of the money, uh, I mean uh, accumulation of the money and when it comes to accumulation of the money, the law tells that it has to be utilized within a period of 5 years. And that is applicable only in case of section 111A. And this kind of a restriction is not there for accumulation under section 11 bracket 2. So as a result of that, you know, whatever you, uh, whatever the organization saves and accumulates over and above the 85%, for that there is no time limit as such. Section 80G, it talks uh, about, you know, the objectives of the trust has to be charitable to ensure that the 80G recognition is given. We can look at couple of amendments uh, because I thought it is quite relevant because we are talking on the topic, we are just abreast of the amendments and then we can... Uh, the primary objective of providing exemption, this I have got from the Memorandum to Finance Bill 2014 and it says, the primary objective of providing exemption in the case of charitable institution is that income derived from property held under the trust should be applied and utilized for the object or purpose of the trust. So it has been noticed in case of certain trusts that they have not applied the income for its objects. So what they have done? However, they have still claimed exemption by resorting to claim of exemption under section 10, the general provision. Section 11 tells that you apply 85%, take the entire income as exempt. But somebody has applied only 70% and balance 15% of income what he has received, he has shown it as one of the incomes under section 10 instead of claiming exemption under section 11, they have claimed exemption under section 10. So in order to discourage this practice, the amendment has been brought in now to tell that in case of section 1023C companies, in case of agricultural income being exempt income alone is allowed as an exemption along with 1023C income. Apart from that, no other section 10 exemptions are applicable. For example, a donor comes, he tell I want to donate to this trust <coughs> Infosys shares. Infosys declares dividends. Primarily all of us will think that 1034 applies, so it is exempt from tax. But now, this section will keep tab of it and it says that the dividend also should be applied for the charitable purposes, otherwise the exemption cannot be given. The next amendment is on the depreciation part. The law tells that in case you have already shown the investment into an asset as an application of income, then you cannot claim depreciation also as an application of income. These were the judgments which were favorable to the SSC and by this amendment, these judgments have been overruled. So uh, the, the purpose is to tell that you know in case you have shown investment of the assets earlier as for objects of the trust and you have claimed the exemption already, once again you cannot claim the depreciation and claim the exemption as an application of income. Uh, so Prashant, even the advances given for a capital asset acquisition would tantamount to uh, application of it. Yes. And there is no specific time period for that one. So in case I have a situation, it's trust may resort to a situation where, where they show it as an advance, but it actually expects only subsequently, only to get away from that 15%. For the ideal is, I mean, as far as it uh, remains within the boundary of 85% uh, yes. technical uh, uh, boundary, I don't think there is anything to stop the exemption. Advance to be like, differentiated from the capital asset. Yes. In the case of section 11 uh, trust, the law has been amended to tell that uh, a trust can have say three institutions. 
one of the institutions is claiming 1023C, another institution has agricultural income, one more, uh, one more uh, activity is the charitable purpose. And in the charitable purpose, you find that 85% has not been applied. You cannot tell that, I'll club all the three and tell that, you know, I have applied more than 85%. Tries to tell here that only 1023C allowed agricultural income, income is allowed. The rest of the income, what you have not applied, that portion of it will be treated as taxable income. So that is the new amendment. Say one second. So in case section 11 trust is having a having the receipts and part of it can be attributed to 1023C income. Part of it is attributable to agricultural income. So part of it is attributable to dividend income. Dividend cannot be taken as a application. The same logic for section 11 also they have applied. The same logic of 1023C what I told. Same logic they have applied to 11. But they have told 1023C because it is allowed in the earlier section. We continue to give the exemption to it. Although you have not applied for the purposes of the trust. But then. When it comes to the other income, you cannot tell that, okay, I have already, you know, uh, applied for 1023C purposes, this I need not apply. They can avoid 1023 directly under 11, why should they have something? No, under 11 you should have satisfied with 85% again. 85%, ensuring that you have not, you, also has not said that, yeah. no, what happens in case you have a dividend income? What happens in case if you have a dividend income? Earlier, it was possible to claim portion as 1023C exemption, then claim agricultural income exemption, then claim dividend also as exemption. Now they have told, dividend I will not give you exemption, take dividend and apply it for the objects of the trust. That is the amount. It means 1023C is not No problem. The only issue is dividend does not pass, so you have to Exactly. The other exempt incomes under section 10 has to be applied for objects of the trust. Same thing. So this was the point I was trying to connect to my earlier slide telling that how powerful the income tax department is going to be in its court. Earlier, the principal commissioner could cancel the registration of a trust citing these two reasons. One is the activities of a trust are not genuine and the, activi or the activities are not being carried out in accordance with the objects of the trust or institution. So there was a vague power given to the principal commissioner telling that these are the two uh, points based on which you can cancel the registration and they were not finding it quite powerful. Now the way they have made it, they have given some sort of a general power, it makes it more stronger for that. It says, no, its income does not endure for general <coughs> benefit of general public. It is for benefit of any particular religious community or caste if it is established after commencement of 1961 Act. If it is prior to 1961 Act, the, 1960, the uh, charitable purpose is still preserved. That is, if a trust does charitable and business. Any income or property of trust is applied for benefit of specified persons like author of trust or trustees. Its funds are invested in prohibited notes. So, in, now the commissioner can cite any of these reasons and cancel the registration. But it was in very vague terms. How do you relate each of this to this? But now there is another advantage. Before that, you have to spend the money for your purpose, what is such the object. Now that is removed. And then before, before? Before, before that, you should spend the money only as per the object close. Hmm. Now, say so they are public purpose. No, it, it is still there. See, its income does not endure the benefit for general public. Yeah, but not necessarily within the objects. Within the objects, what happens? Taxation takes care. It need not, not do cancellation. See, what they want to do, cancellation of registration is those extraneous factors which would, you know, depart from the, from the I mean, it questions the existence of the organization itself. I don't think just because you did not put the money in proper purposes, you need to close the organization tomorrow. It is quite possible that sometimes it did not happen. Instead of 85%, you put only 80% as your application of income. Does not warrant closure of the organization itself. There is taxing provision to take care of. So this is only on the cancellation of registration part which has been handled here. When it comes to anonymous donation, this is the last amendment and we can conclude with this. 
uh, it says that say for example total donation donations was 100 lakhs now anonymous donations is say 10 lakhs out of this in this excess of 10 lakhs less higher of 5 percent of total or 1 lakh is 5 lakhs in this case because what what uh, that is pre-amendment scenario they were only taxing the 5 lakhs part of the anonymous donation now what has happened is they take 5 lakhs into 30 percent 95 lakhs is taxed and full 10 lakhs anonymous donation is also taxed so this is the deviation telling that the anonymous donation will be in scanner henceforth and there is going to be extra liability on that to that effect section 115 bbc has been amended so thanks for patient hearing and it was a joy talking to all of you thanks a lot as well as uh, CA Sri Lakshmi P for uh, touching upon the various aspects involved in the, these topics in a very easy to understand manner. And also thank you for taking all those wonderful questions that our participants have for you. As a token of appreciation, I request uh, CA Sini Thomas, the seminar coordinator, to present a memento to CA Sri Lakshmi P as well as CA K. Prashant.